a, f- a music community in New Zealand not to not to need to go somewhere else. That's what they thought in Australia too, of course. I know. Uh, the the but... argument for Eurovision is that although it's catch, it is, it's also innocent, it's a family night, it's a return to wholesome, uncomplicated pop. You know, whether or not you hanker for those days, I don't know. Well, ABBA did win, win, and I was a very big ABBA fan back in that day, so, yeah, maybe. But we could do our own thing, couldn't we? Just have, yeah, we, well, we do have do our own thing. We do have our own things. A, you know, they're, they're, New Zealand's got talent and things well, like that. Well, yeah. well, if we're really serious, we could have a Pacific vision <laughs> contest rather than... Well, why that, do we have to go uh, to Europe? That's <laughs> right. We used to have that... Um, uh, TV show, didn't we? That Sharon O'Neill once was it uh, something? Yeah, and Tina Cross. Yeah, Tina Cross was, was rep- represented New Zealand too. Yeah, way before okay. my time. <laughs> All right, I think I've. I think I can sense your opinions on that. The uh, before we go, the uh, great Waiheke fairy wrought <laughs> the spin-off mag called this yesterday. A tiny group of a hundred super gold card holders hoovering up more than two hundred thousand dollars worth of free trips to Waiheke Island every year, and. Uh, Ganesh panellist Ian Telford did the maths and said this was actually only one trip a week each. Mm. But we got a lot of reaction, which is why I'm mentioning it again, and one of the typical comment was the ferry is going whether the the gold card holders are on it or not. And Ganesh, I suppose economically that is an unassailable fact. Precisely. It's a question of, uh, to get, not to get too boring, but it's a question of the marginal versus the average. Can you explain that? Well, if there's one extra person, do you assign um, the whole of the cost of running the boat to that one extra person, or do you average it across everybody? <laughs> and what's your conclusion about the value or not of trips to Waiheke for people with a Super Gold card? Um, well, it depends on how you define value. I'm sure they see it as valuable, and I'm sure that they see it as um, useful for their purposes. It's a, as for most economic questions, it's a question of what the other alternative was. Well, they probably go and at least have a cup of tea and a bun, don't you think? I would have thought so. Add that to some, you know, Waiheke cafe somewhere. This was quite persuasive. There are many pensioners on Waiheke who aren't the new super rich with estates on island vineyards. And the gold card makes the difference between being able to afford trips to a medical specialist and having to move from their long-standing homes elsewhere. That's people going from Waiheke, isn't it, into the city? Yeah, well, the they, other they, way. They, they then have to go back again. Though. They do. This is true. <laughs> Why is the age for a senior concession in New Zealand always 65, yet in Australia and Britain it's usually 60? Uh, Peter is right. In Australia, you can start using your card at 60 if you are retired or if you work less than 35 hours a week. But I think we're happy with... Well, there's never been serious remonstrance against age 65 for travel, free travel, has there? Well, we haven't really had a choice, have we? No. No. Well, well, we do now because we know what other countries do, like Australia and Britain. Uh, Thank you both for being on the panel today. Uh, even though it's going to be a wet weekend, Catherine, you'll be very busy. Actually. I will. I will come to Featherstone Booktown, people. Featherstone Booktown for Catherine. Mm-hmm. And Ganesh, what are you up to? Anything special? Uh, I'm in the midst of my uh, training for my next marathon, so I'm in the midst. Oh, I've got a crikey. 28k run, either Saturday or Sunday, depending on which one doesn't rain. You're very good. He's very good. I'll He's going to live to be 125. <laughs> That's right. Ganesh Nana, Catherine Robertson, thank you both thank so much. You. Uh, That's the panel for the week, everybody. Thank you for your company and for joining us this week. And Checkpoint with John Campbell, coming right up. Welcome, everyone, to Checkpoint. Tonight, police have just released CTV pictures of a man who... Allegedly attacked an Auckland jogger this morning, dragging her into bushes, strangling and indecently assaulting her. Seven people, including four children, have been found dead at a home in Western Australia. We will have the latest on that. Retail chain Smith City has been caught underpaying minimum wage workers for at least 15 years by expecting them to attend an unpaid daily morning meeting. A woman found not guilty of aiding the suicide of an elderly Wellington woman is convicted and fined for importing a suicide drug. EQC is officially running out of budget money and with the budget next week, we look at boat health.
RNZ News at five o'clock. Good afternoon, I'm Anna Thomas. A company behind a big construction firm that was ordered to pay millions of dollars for building a leaky high school in Auckland has gone into receivership. Hawkins built the Botany Down Secondary College in Auckland, but with the sale of the company to Downer last year, responsibility passed to Orange H Group, a company set up to oversee legacy projects, which has just gone into receivership owing $30 million. A company spokesman, David McConnell, says the High Court ruling over Botany Downs was a surprise. We have considered appeal, but obviously the state of the group and we're at it, you know, we think that's sort of unaffordable. In terms of resolution of that, that will be really with the receiver and the ministry to work through. It's so difficult for me to say much more than that at this stage. David McConnell says the receiver, McGrath Nickel, will be communicating with creditors. A euthanasia advocate who brought lethal drugs into New Zealand, including those which another woman used to kill herself, has lost her bid to avoid conviction. Susie Austin was sentenced in the High Court in Wellington today and convicted of two charges of importing pentobarbitone and fined more than $7,000. Anne-Marie May reports. Justice Thomas said Susie Austin's drug importations were premeditated and organised and she had sought to minimise the seriousness of her offending by referring to her genuine desire to help others. The defence lawyer, Donald Stevens QC, sought a discharge without conviction, saying the consequences of a conviction would outweigh the seriousness of Austin's offending. However, Justice Thomas disagreed. She said Austin broke the law knowingly and her crusading for a law change did not reduce her culpability for breaking the current law. Outside the court, Susie Austin thanked her supporters and urged others to back the End of Life Choices Bill. This is Anne-Marie May. Police are treating the deaths of four children and three adults at a home in Western Australia as a murder-suicide. The incident is the worst mass shooting in Australia since the 1996 Port Arthur massacre, in which 35 people died and another 23 were seriously injured. Catherine Hutton reports. A phone call from a man associated with a rural property 20 kilometres northeast of Margaret River alerted the police shortly after 5 o'clock this morning. On arrival, they found two adults outside, while the other five bodies were inside the house. Two firearms were found at the scene. Police Commissioner Chris Dawson says they are working to contact next of kin and friends. This devastating tragedy will no doubt have a lasting impact um, on the families concerned, the whole community, and in particular, the local communities in our southwest. Detectives from Perth are helping local police. The ages and other details of those who have died have not been released. This is Catherine Hutton. Auckland police say a passerby saved the victim of a sexually motivated assault from a much more prolonged attack. They say the woman was running beside the northern motorway in St Mary's Bay about 5 o'clock this morning when a man grabbed her. He dragged her into bushes near St Mary's Road where he choked and indecently assaulted her. Detective Inspector Scott Beard says the woman was lucky because a passing cyclist went to investigate muffled sounds. And when the attacker saw him, he ran off. Scott Beard says the attacker is about 180 centimetres tall, of slim build, with short black hair. The police have increased patrols in the area and are asking locals to check their CCTV for any sightings of the man. The union representing Qantas staff say workers are afraid and frustrated after a mystery leak from its central Auckland building forced evacuations and hospitalised colleagues. Altogether, 15 people in Augusta House were taken to hospital yesterday after being exposed to what the Auckland Regional Public Health Service is calling an unknown chemical. John Crocker from Unite Union says Qantas workers are not being allowed back inside. They're hanging around in the city, not really knowing what's going on, when they're going to get back to work or, you know, <laughs> when they should call it a day and head home. Um, obviously, they're, you know, they're a little bit afraid. They don't want injury and they've seen their colleagues um, injured. But they're obviously frustrated by this, you know. While, while this investigation goes on, they're, they're as in the dark as anyone else. Staff has launched an investigation. Bay Group, the company which owns and manages Augusta House, declined to comment. It's five past five.
The Blues coach Tana Umanga says last week's victory over the Waratahs, just their third win of the season, has given the underdogs plenty of confidence ahead of tonight's Super Rugby clash with the Hurricanes in Auckland. The second-placed Hurricanes are chasing their ninth straight win and are heavy favourites, so the Blues' boost in confidence certainly came at the right time. It's huge for us in terms of confidence. You know, like you just tell after the game and carried throughout the, the week and that you know when we get things right uh, and we stick to a plan you know, we, the, the results will, will come and just keeping belief in that. Tana Umanga. Tonight's game starts at 7.35. The Nelson cyclist George Bennett is cursing himself despite finishing fourth on the latest stage of the Giro d'Italia. Bennett moved into ninth overall after narrowly missing out on a podium finish on the 163-kilometre sixth stage to the top of Mount Etna in Sicily. He's 1 minute 11 seconds behind leader Simon Yates of England but believes that difference could be much less. I rode like a... An idiot. I attacked too much. I was too uh, too confident. Yeah, when when Yates win, I had to go. But I'd already gone three times, and uh, ah, I'm uh, quite disappointed at myself. George Bennett. And Manchester United have assured themselves of a second place in the English Football Premier League after a nil-all draw at West Ham. The result puts United four points ahead of third-place Tottenham with just one game remaining. That's the news. Tonight on Nights... Country Life visits the Mutapala School. It's going global. We have something spooky for the weekend. Because it's just two days until Lisbon hosts the grand final, we have a sonic tonic dedicated to Eurovision. That's right, the songs of Europe and all their glory. I mean, just listen to that, will you? And between 10 and 11 p.m., join me, Karen Hay, for Lately. We'll be focusing on the events of the day, both nationally and internationally, and talking to the newsmakers in an eclectic mix that covers everything from the arts to politics to live events. That's Lately with Karen Hay in the 10pm hour, weeknights on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty. Cloudy with showers turning to rain and some heavy falls tomorrow. Waitomo, Taranaki, Tomaranui, Taupo and Taihape. Periods of rain with some heavy falls from later today. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, Wairarapa. High cloud with isolated showers turning to scattered rain north of Wairarapa later tomorrow. Whanganui to Wellington, occasional showers clearing south of Whanganui tomorrow afternoon. For Marlborough and Nelson, remaining rain clearing and then mainly fine. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, rain with some heavy falls in the south, clearing in Fiordland tonight and elsewhere tomorrow morning. For Canterbury, mainly fine for you, however a few showers with southerlies tomorrow. Otago and Southland, scattered rain spreading north, then clearing tomorrow morning. And for the Chatham Islands, mostly cloudy rain at times, clearing tomorrow afternoon. RNZ National, it's eight past five and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. And Anna Thomas, thank you very much indeed Anna. We're going to begin tonight in Western Australia where seven people have been found dead in a murder-suicide at a home near the town of Margaret River. That's just under 300 k south of Perth. The bodies of three adults and four children were discovered this morning. Police say it's the worst mass shooting in Australia since 1996 when Port Arthur gunman Martin Bryant killed 35 people and injured 23 others. We're going to go live to Perth later in the program, but first, Australian Police Commissioner Chris Dawson has just held a media conference. Let's hear what he had to say. Uh, police are currently responding to what I can only describe as a horrific incident in Osmington, which is about 20 kilometres uh, northeast of Margaret River. It's still very early in this investigation, but based on what we do know, this is clearly a tragedy. At about 5.15 a.m. this morning, police were called to a rural property on the outskirts uh, of this property at Margaret River. Upon arrival, uh, police located seven persons deceased. Uh, four children and three adults. The bodies of two adults were located outside. Five bodies were located inside a building on the rural property. Two firearms have been located at the scene. We are trying to locate other members of the family and friends. I'm not in a position to release any further details about the identities of the deceased. 
This devastating tragedy will no doubt have a lasting impact um, on the families concerned, the whole community, and in particular the local communities in our South West. Homicide squad detectives from Perth are assisting local police in investigating the circumstances surrounding this tragedy. They will of course be supported by other specialist police units. That's Australian Police Commissioner Chris Dawson speaking a short time ago. We should say Perth is four hours behind New Zealand, so 5.15 there was 9.15 here. We will go live to Perth later in the program. But we go now to the very edge of downtown Auckland where a female jogger was dragged into bushes, strangled and indecently assaulted early this morning. She was running alongside the northern motorway in St Mary's Bay or just below it when she was grabbed from behind by the offender who's believed to be aged in his early 20s. As terrible and terrifying as the attack uh, was, the woman is now at home. The assailant is still at large and it's thought only the intervention of a passing cyclist prevented the attack from being even more serious. Detective Inspector Scott Baird is calling for witnesses as police release CTV pictures of the man they believe is responsible. This morning, just after 5am, a woman who was jogging beside the northern motorway at uh, St Mary's Bay, just near where the uh, walkway overbridge goes over to, towards West Haven, and she jogged past a bush area and a man has come out of the bush, grabbed her from behind, dragged from the bush, thrown her down and started to strangle her and then indecently assault her. What an absolutely terrifying attack and how did it end? Look, it is terrifying and um, the woman was really lucky because there was a cyclist who was cycling past and heard some muffled type sounds and went back and saw the male there on top of her and the male saw him, got up and ran off and our witness chased him, chased him through some properties in St Mary's Bay where he actually managed to climb over a two-metre fence in the property and got away. So, well done, that cyclist. Absolutely. OK, and you would have a reasonable description of the offender from the cyclist and, of course, the victim? Yeah, more from the cyclist. As I say, the victim was attacked from behind, so she didn't really see a lot. But the description given is a male, dark-skinned, Possibly Indian with short black hair, around 175 to 180 centimetres tall and slim build. Around mid-twenties or even younger and was briefly wearing a dark blue jersey which had some white writing on it. A dark blue jersey with some white writing on it. That is a neighbourhood where uh, at least some of the homes will have uh, cameras, uh, you know, um, outside. So, you, so I guess you're retracing the steps of that of that uh, chase, that pursuit. Will there also potentially be things like fingerprints and skin cells and stuff left on the fences that they were climbing over? Part of the investigation today, obviously, has been certainly to look after the woman who was attacked. And we've had support with her. She's been you know, taken to the uh, medical staff and treated there. And she's got now family support with her. So that's a key for us, is looking after our victim here. Uh, we have done scene examinations, certainly where the attack actually took place, as well as the route where the offender ran, including climbing over that fence. Of course, police are asking anybody in the neighbourhood who does have CCTV that may have captured this person running past, if they could contact police, that'd be appreciated. I know you're not in the speculation business, but uh, I, 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 I guess, are you thinking about what might have happened had that cyclist not come along? You, you, yes, we're not here to speculate, but the reality was it was a sexual assault, and I think because that cyclist came along, uh, that woman has been saved from something worse. And her condition now, is she at home or in hospital? No, after she received medical treatment, obviously she was fairly traumatised this morning and the support around her, both with the Auckland Sexual Assault Help and with family and through the police, uh, you know, she's certainly recovering. Right, so that part of, of what really is the, the central city, or just on the outskirts of it, uh, what's your advice to people, uh, who, who, women in particular obviously, who are... Uh, who go jogging around there until this uh, man is apprehended? 
Look, the police are putting additional frontline presence in the area and they attempt to, A, prevent anything further happening, but also to catch the offender. But we are really relying on the public to help us here. Uh, someone will know who that person is. But the message to anybody out there who's running, jogging, walking around is be aware of your own personal safety. Uh, don't take things for granted. Um, and just be vigilant. Detective Inspector Scott Beard, uh, during that interview, we were just putting uh, some photos up on the screen. If you were listening and you uh, just have a sense, you might know who Scott Beard is talking about. The photos are available on our Facebook page. The clothes certainly are fairly particular and distinct, a cap and a top uh, that you may well recognise if you know this person. Do have a look. We turn now to EQC. And Checkpoint can tonight reveal that the Earthquake Commission has written to the Minister, Dr Megan Woods, to signal their net assets are now as low as $287 million and will soon reach the $200 million mark that triggers the Crown Guarantee. In the 73 years EQC has existed, the Crown Guarantee has never been used. What does that mean? Well... Since it came into existence in 1945, the Earthquake Commission has collected levies from the insurance premiums paid by you, probably for home and contents insurance policies. That money was effectively its own form of insurance against the cost of a massive earthquake. But a flaw of 200 million exists and the Crown has to step in at that point where the guarantee all costs will be met. And after Christchurch, the fund is now almost that low. Now, Megan Woods told me they've been charting the fund's descent and they absolutely knew this day would come. No surprises. I asked her how much money the government thinks will be required. Um, well, that needs to be worked through, depending on what the outstanding liabilities are at that point in which they're assessed. So it's all complicated insurance accounting at that point. But the, the point of the matter is, is that people can have faith in EQC because um, we've had a really settled period of time where we didn't have a whole lot of seismic activity. Um, and then we've had the last um, eight years in New Zealand, and there's always been that guarantee for New Zealanders that sit there that if the fund is depleted, then there's a crown guarantee that sits behind it. And no one is saying this money should have, shouldn't have been spent. But in 2010, before the earthquakes, it was $6.1 billion. It's now uh, about $287 million. That's what right. happens if there is another major earthquake? Well, I mean, that, that's something as a government that we'll need to face. So at EQC, as well as the board, as well as doing the responsible thing of writing to me, letting me know that, are obviously working on the plan they need to put in place in, or, in order to refuel that fund. Because you're quite right, we have to think about that future. It's a, it's a when, not if, unfortunately, in New Zealand. Um, but uh, the Crown Guarantee sits behind EQC, and that's something of which New Zealanders can have a great deal of faith in their level of cover in New Zealand, and one of the reasons why reinsurers look on us so favourably. Will we see this figure in the budget next week? Um, look, it's not, it's not as simple as that. You won't see a line item, but I, what I can reassure you is this is something that we've known since uh, we became government. It's something that we've known is coming while we've put together this budget, and it has not been far from our thinking, so it is certainly accounted for. Can we talk about the cap? I don't know if you heard Sir Miller on Checkpoint the other day reacting to the case of Georgina Hannafin, who has hit cap mm -hmm. or is hitting cap, which means that EQC can't give him more than $100,000. Her private insurer is saying this is EQC's markup, it is not our business. So she is left in a position of negative equity, mortgaged to the eyeballs with a house she can't sell, which is a disaster. Is the cap problematic when EQC haven't done their job well enough? Well, that's still the live question, John, and that's a really frustrating thing for all of us. I don't think anyone could have listened to that story and not felt for the individual that's in that situation. They're heart-wrenching stories. But the problem is it's not clear that it necessarily lies with EQC. Look, if I could just wave a magic wand and fix this, believe me, I would have. But what we have to do is make sure that we sort out this complex problem because there, there isn't just one story out there. there you know, we know there's at least 600-odd, um, you know, and we need to find a way to fix this for people so they can get on with their right, lives. What is that way? Surely it requires some tweak or amendment to the act that covers EQC and its cap, doesn't it? Well, one of the things that we have to do is make sure that that liability does actually sit with EQC, and that's far from... Um, well, who else would... Sorry, the, sorry, Minister. Well, who else could it sit with in these circumstances? Well, well, it could be the way in which the private insurer interpreted the insurance policy. It could be the um, contractor. It could be the project management company. We've identified there's probably... And it, and it could be EQC. There's probably about four places it could sit. So uh, a letter from one of the people that could themselves be liable isn't the conclusive... But um, I've seen... Forgive me for interrupting. 
because, yes, it could sit with all of those people, but I've seen the contract between EQC and Fletcher's. It indemnifies Fletcher's against the buck stopping with them. In other words, this is a theoretical discussion. In the end, the only people who can own this are EQC or the private insurer. You can't go back to the contractors. It says that in writing. Well, that, that's also the, the thing we're looking at. What the Fletcher's contract is indemnified for is the, work, is the workmanship. What the question is is whether or not Fletcher's had a duty as the project management office. That's what the contract is for. It's for their role as the project manager rather than the work itself. And, I mean, this is where it gets complicated and it's uh, splitting legal hairs in the way they often are and why it is com complex and complicated and needs to be done properly. Are you seeking legal advice on any of those options? And let's talk about the individual contractors, for example. Are you now looking at going back and pursuing individual contractors who did faulty work? No, what we've sought the legal advice in EQC is the, the Crown Law advice that they're getting around the Project Management Office um, in terms of what the, what the obligations were there. There's the obvious, um, if there was faulty workpersonship, that there are guarantees for people in legislation already in, term, in terms of consumer guarantees. The PMO, the Project Management Office, that was Fletcher's, right? Yes. Okay, so you are seeking, you are absolutely, the Crown is absolutely seeking and receiving formal legal advice in terms of a case you could potentially take against Fletcher's. EQC has asked for that advice. Minister, it's great to have you. Just uh, while, you, we, while we've got you on the phone, the Southern Response Class Action Claimants, when will a settlement be announced with them, do you know? Uh, look, we're, we're hopeful something will be, be able to announce soon. When soon? Soon. <laughs> like next week? <laughs> soon. OK, and, and any idea how big the settlement is? Uh, look, I can't talk about that yet, but I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with you um, when it's appropriate. And that will be full and final. That is the end of that. that is, it, it, that's either a done deal for some of the claimants or a precedent for everyone else. We'll have a discussion about it once we have something to say. Megan Woods, the Minister, we will obviously cover that Southern Response class action uh, in some detail. It's 22 minutes past five. Retail chain Smith City has been caught underpaying minimum wage workers for at least 15 years. Every morning at every one of the 34 Smith City stores across New Zealand, sales staff are expected to attend a 15-minute meeting before the store opened. But they weren't paid for that time. In a cut-and-dry employment court decision, a judge found that illegal and has given Smith City... Three months to pay up. Our reporter, Zach Fleming, has more. Smith City told sales staff to be at work for an 8.45am meeting, but it didn't start paying them until 15 minutes later at 9am when the store opened. It did this for at least 15 years. For a full-time employee on the minimum wage, that was around $800 a year of unpaid work. If employees are doing something which is important to their job and the business is getting benefit from it, then they need to be paid for their time because it's work. And employers should not be passing the costs of doing business on to their employees. It sounds quite straightforward. That's the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment's Labour Inspectorate Manager, Luar Ward. Smith City now has to calculate arrears below the minimum wage for all current and former employees for the past six years. Nobody's prepared to guess how much money that could be, but $800 per person per year, hundreds of minimum wage staff, six years. Because of the systemic nature of the breach, we think that it could be quite substantial. Smith City's accepted the employment court decision, but that's only now after an appeal, where it argued the meetings were voluntary and not work despite describing the meetings as to give information to allow staff to be more effective in making sales, and staff were told off if they were late. I asked CEO Roy Campbell why the change of heart? Why is Smith City now in agreement with the court? Um, the answer would be that when we looked at how the original notice was put, we didn't agree with that and we wanted to ensure that we were discharging our obligations as a fair and equitable employee fairly and correctly. So we did challenge it so that we could have our voice being heard. Clearly, um, we uh, were not successful in the appeal, so we respect the final judgment of the court in this matter. But I put to Mr Campbell that towing the line of the law, telling minimum wage employees to work for 15 minutes unpaid every morning was neither fair nor ethical, and neither was appealing the original decision. Well, I think we are a fair and ethical employer, and again, um, I think that our, our uh, um, 
media release here talking about the, our acceptance of this determination would indicate so. I think the fact that, uh, again, that uh, three years ago we moved to make sure that we are paying the minimum wage as a minimum, and many of our employees earn more than the minimum wage across our business indicates that we are trying to be a fair and ethical employer. So uh, as to other people's opinions, um, I can't speculate on that. I can only tell you what we as a company wish to do on behalf of uh, our shareholders, our staff and ourselves, and that is to act in accordance with the law in a fair and ethical way, and that's simply what we're doing. The Council of Trade Unions, or CTU, gave expert advice to Chief Employment Court Judge Christina Ingalls for the case. I asked its secretary, Sam Huggard, if what Smith City did was fair and ethical. It's completely unfair to expect workers to turn up to work, be part of a work meeting or undertaking any other work activities and not get paid for it. So I think the vast majority of employers would look at this decision and go, well, of course, if we're expecting our workers to turn up, we're going to pay them. Um, But it's been really good to have that that clarified that Smith City's position was wrong. In its drive to be fair and ethical, I asked CEO Roy Campbell if Smith City would pay back everyone who went to the unpaid meetings over the past 15 years, not just six as enforced by the court. So we will respect the judgment of the court. So can I just confirm that means that you'll only pay back six years, you won't go any further back than that? We will respect the judgment of the court. In other words, no, Smith City won't go back further than six years. The CTU wishes it would. If they do have information about the underpayment going back beyond that, then a, a sensible and logical decision will be to go, we have underpaid workers for beyond those six years, and we'll make available um, resources to, to pay them back for those longer periods too. MB says it's likely other businesses are doing similar things to Smith City, not paying staff for all of the work they do, and it's using this case to issue a warning. Things like um, requiring people to work after the store is closed to cash up the tills or shift changeovers and that not being paid, and this decision makes it very clear that those types of activities are work and we will be coming knocking, so my advice and the Labour Inspectorate's advice to businesses is to get your business in order and make sure that employees are being paid for all the time that they spend working. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And if you work for an employer that does that or something similar, please text us 2101. It's 27 minutes past five. A euthanasia advocate has been convicted of two charges of importing pentobarbitone, a drug which can be used to commit suicide. Following a trial in the High Court in Wellington in February, Susan Austin was found guilty of the drug charges, but she was acquitted of assisting the suicide of Anne-Marie Treadwell, who killed herself using drugs which Austin supplied. Today, Justice Thomas convicted and ordered Austin to pay more than $7,000 in fines. However, her supporters are urging people to have their say on the end-of-life choices bill to avoid such cases taking place in the future. Our reporter Anne-Marie May was at the sentencing hearing. Justice Thomas said Susan Austin's drug importations were premeditated and organised and she had not taken responsibility or expressed any remorse. She said Austin sought to minimise the seriousness of her offending by referring to her genuine desire to help others. What is troubling about that, however, is there is nothing to suggest you are qualified to help people by providing them with a lethal drug. When you were interviewed by the police in connection with Mrs Treadwell's suicide, you told them you were quite naive about her mental health. The defence lawyer, Dr Donald Stevens, sought a discharge without conviction, reading from references which spoke of Austin's high ideals and compassion, including one from the former MP and euthanasia campaigner, Mary Ann Street. One of the other referees described Mrs Austin as an amazing woman who has, quote, the attributes we could all aspire to, compassionate, generous, honest and loyal. Dr Stevens said the consequences of a conviction would outweigh the seriousness of Austin's offending, including affecting international travel and her charity work, but Justice Thomas disagreed. Given your long period of volunteering and the publicity which your offending has already received, I do not consider there is a real and appreciable risk that you will be barred from future volunteering opportunities. That an organisation might decline your services in light of your offending is a different matter. Susan Austin says she was disappointed about not being discharged without conviction. However, she thanked all those who supported her and urged others to get involved in backing the End of Life Choices Bill. Please be proactive. Help make it happen. It is such a pity that law-abiding citizens who wish to avoid a lingering unbearable death 
under the current law may have to break the law by importing drugs. Austin supporters packed the public gallery at the High Court. One of them, Helen Cartmel, says the publicity arising from the police operation which targeted euthanasia advocates who had gathered at Austin's home had done more for the cause than the advocates could have done themselves. And whether people are supportive or not, they couldn't have avoided the issue. I think a lot of people have now started to think really hard about whether this opportunity for people to have assisted dying should now be enshrined in law. In April, the Independent Police Conduct Authority ruled the police broke the law by setting up the bogus breath testing checkpoint to target euthanasia advocates. The Privacy Commissioner found the collection of information at the checkpoint was also a breach of the Privacy Act. For her part, Susan Austin says she will no longer be importing drugs. For Checkpoint, Anne-Marie May. Meanwhile, a 104-year-old Australian scientist has ended his own life by assisted suicide in Switzerland. Ecologist David Goodall, we've covered his case. He wasn't terminally ill, but he said his quality of life was such that it simply wasn't worth living. Jacob Greaves from Reuters reports. Listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, 104-year-old David Goodall has ended his life by euthanasia. The Australian scientist travelled to Switzerland for the procedure. In his native Australia, euthanasia is forbidden. Seen here arriving at the end-of-life clinic, he wore a jumper saying, ageing disgracefully, and told reporters he was ready. My life has been rather poor for the past year or so, and I'm very happy to end it. In this room on Thursday, he gave himself a lethal injection. His relatives there to provide support. Goodall was not terminally ill, but felt his health had deteriorated in recent years. In Switzerland, assisted suicide has been legal since the 1940s. Goodall had said he would have preferred death in Australia. He was born in England in 1914, before moving there in 1948. An expert in arid shrublands, he also worked in Britain and held posts at US universities. But he hopes to leave a lasting legacy on the debate surrounding euthanasia. All the publicity that has been receiving can only, I think, help the cause of euthanasia for the elderly. Coming up on Checkpoint, Nelson Woman Rose Renton denies rubbing rat poison on former Environment Minister Nick Smith. And our political editor, Jane Patterson, looks ahead to next week's budget and at the public health system. Just how much money is required and how much money will be spent. And Clark Gayford on preparing to take on a new role of first dad. We'd love your feedback. Text us 2101, particularly if you work for an employer who requires you to start earlier than you are paid to start from. We're hearing from a few already. Do keep uh, coming in with those employees. Emil next was business news, but um, with the time at 27 minutes to six, here's the 27 minutes to six headlines. Thanks, John. And what police are calling the worst mass shooting in Australia since the Port Arthur massacre of 1996. The police are treating the deaths of four children and three adults at a home in Western Australia as a murder-suicide. Police got the call from a man associated with the rural property 20 kilometres northeast of Margaret River shortly after five in the morning. They found the two adults outside and the five other bodies inside the house. Two firearms were found at the scene. The company behind a big construction firm ordered to pay millions of dollars for a building a leaky high school in Auckland has gone into receivership. Hawkins built the Botany Down Secondary College in Auckland, but with the sale of the company to Downer last year, responsibility passed to Orange H Group, a company set up to oversee legacy projects, which has just gone into receivership, owing $30 million. Nelson MP Nick Smith says having rat poison rubbed on him is the most serious abuse he's had in his 27 years as a politician. He was giving evidence in the Nelson District Court today in a hearing against Rose Renton, who's denied the charge. Mr Smith says protesters rubbed rat poison on him while he was at his National Party caravan at the weekly Nelson Market last September.
The coroner has found an electric blanket which was more than 40 years old, sparked the fire which killed a retired Thames man. 76-year-old Arthur Earl Plimley died of smoke inhalation last August after an electric blanket which she had modified to raise the voltage, faulted and set his mattress alight. WorkSafe is investigating the mystery fumes in a central Auckland office building that put 15 people in hospital yesterday. Another 100 people were assessed on site, but numerous tests failed to establish the source of the problem at Augusta House in Victoria Street West. WorkSafe said its investigation could take some time. And that's the news. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. Uh, 25 minutes to six. Let's go to business news now with Emile Donovan. Emile, it's been a fairly heavy old programme so far. We need your glorious, youthful, smiling face to cheer us all up. What's up, G? I hear uh, there is a something of a purple patch for the manufacturing industry. Yeah, and that's that's the first time I've been called G in quite some time, John. <laughs> it's very enjoyable. <laughs> um, yeah, it's <laughs> activity in the manufacturing sector. That's right. Um, it's actually it's hit its highest level since 2016. Uh, so there you go. This is from a new. Oh, do, 20, well, well, hold on a sec. 2016. Last year was 2017, and this year is 2018. So, yeah, it's yeah, not, I, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're not talking mate, drought. You make a good point there, John. <laughs> I mean, look, in monthly in monthly surveys, two years is a long time. Okay, okay, go on there. <laughs> Um, so, look, it's from a new BNZ survey, as I say, and this is interesting because really uh, recent surveys, both in the manufacturing production industry and uh, business confidence in general, have been, you know, doom, gloom, hell in a handbasket. A, a lot of businesses are convinced that the economy is uh, is really going to, to, to have a downturn in the next year. Um, but without bigging things up too much, this index really shows pretty much just the opposite to be true. Manufacturers are producing more, they're taking more orders, they're creating more jobs. Um, and so, look, while it's hard to definitively say what's going on here, and, and, and these surveys do vary significantly from month to month, uh, the, the, the one thing that's for certain really is that perception of what's going on doesn't always match up to the reality. Yeah, yeah, the, the truth. Uh, some more activity in the real estate market too, we're hearing, right? That's right, yeah. So we've got some new numbers out from the Real Estate Institute. It's a breakdown of property sales from the 16 regions. Uh, pretty steady as she goes stuff here. Three quarters of the regions have seen the number of properties sold increase and prices also grew in 14 out of the 16 regions. So um, it's, I guess, good news in, in one way of looking at it. Anyway, um, some areas actually, we're talking sort of Manawatu, Nelson, Otago, um, they actually hit record highs. Uh, so reports of the industry's decline, though I'm not sure there were really that many to be taken seriously, uh, you could say greatly exaggerated. Meanwhile, the median house price has brushed up to $550,000, that's a rise of 10 grand on last month. Uh, so a good time to own a house, John, I say, through gritted teeth. Yeah, um, and, yeah I suspect lots and, of young uh, people will be gritting their teeth as they listen to that, Emil. <laughs> And look, um, I've just got one last thing. This is hot off the presses. This only came out about 20 minutes ago. Um, so forgive me, I'm going to have to read it. Um, the administrators of an insurance company, the troubled insurance company, CBL Corporation, have recommended that it be placed into liquidation. Um, the administrators called Amentha administrators uh, made that recommendation in a report to creditors ahead of a watershed meeting next Friday. Mm -hmm. They are saying liquidation will allow the liquidator to make further investigations into how that company got into such trouble. Um, the key subsidiary of CBL Corporation is an insurance business which the Reserve Bank applied to put into liquidation in February and the administrators say they're working with some of the directors on a proposal to restructure the group. Yes, I remember both Giles and Nona talking about uh, that case. Thank you so much, Mill. Uh, it's good to have that update. How are the markets looking at the end of the week? Uh, at the end of the week, well, the NZX50 is up 39 points, that's 0.45 of a percent, and it actually closed at a record high of 8,676. The dollar strengthened very slightly after it dipped yesterday. Uh, it's buying 69.6 US cents, 92.4 Australian, and 51.4 pence. Emil Donovan, we enjoy your company. Ben from Wellington, thank you, and have a great weekend.
Rose Renton says it started as a symbolic protest against a controversial poison drop at a Nelson Wildlife Sanctuary. But Nick Smith calls it the most serious incident in his 27 years as Nelson MP. Dr Smith said he had poison rubbed in his hair and clothes while Ms Renton maintained she only ever touched him lightly. The case opened in the Nelson District Court today before two justices of the peace and our reporter Tracy Neal was there. It's a fraud, a crime against nature. It's all in our backyard. Oh, right. oh, 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 but you don't want you, it. You're fine to do it in our backyard. It's okay with 20 years. We're all to have a Yeah, and you don't listen, Smith. You don't listen, Smith. You listen to no one. The events of last September were captured on cell phones, but it's what they don't show that's in dispute. Dr Smith, who was Environment Minister at the time, was going about his weekly constituent meetings from his caravan parked at the Nelson Market. Ms Renton and her partner went there from the Brook Sanctuary several kilometres away and a kerfuffle took place. In an interview with the police played in court today, Ms Renton says she was among residents of the Brook Valley reacting to an aerial drop of poison pellets in a nearby wildlife sanctuary. It was heartbreaking and a very emotional morning for the people that live there and have lived and farmed up there, one for generations. They blamed Dr Smith's administration for allowing the poison drop to happen. Ms Renton and her partner took advantage of a large police presence at the sanctuary and headed to the Nelson Market and Dr Smith's caravan. I suggested it would be a good idea to show Nick what it felt like to be violated by poison and violated in a symbolic way and suggested chicken pellets or animal feed. Her partner suggested rat bait. They bought it off the shelf from the warehouse. She was later charged with offensive behaviour after police initially thought the incident warranted an assault charge. Ms Renton denies witness statements she was seen rubbing the poison in Dr Smith's face or that she threatened his family. I never touched Nick Smith's face, as he said in the media. I never shoved Nick Smith, as he said in the media, and I never threatened his family, as Nick said in the media. The way I see it is Nick Smith is using his position as an MP to um, bully back. Detective Fiona Hutchings told the court today the cell phone footage shows the pair putting their hands on Dr Smith's lapels but not on his face. Dr Smith says he's adamant he got poison rubbed on his face and hair but conceded the videos did not show the rat poison being thrown. The part of the incident that is not shown in either of those videos that I did see was the throwing of the uh, poison. I certainly saw pallets being thrown into the caravan. Uh, and later, when we cleaned the caravan up, they were found. And secondly, there was um, pellets or powder that was thrown to me, or at me. The debate then moved into a political tussle between defence lawyer Sue Gray, who asked Dr Smith if he was aware that inappropriate use of poison was harmful to the environment. He said he didn't know he was on trial for decisions he'd made as environment minister. I'm having difficulty understanding where these questions relate to an offensive incident well, that occurred at the market. Well, my questions, Dr Smith, because we've agreed it all depends on the circumstances. I'm asking you about the I, circumstances. I'm happy to answer questions in the Parliament about the policy that I had as Minister of Conservation, and I answered many. I didn't think I was here before the court to answer questions about the government's policy. Ms Renton told the police at the time if she had her time again, she wouldn't have done it. The hearing is set to continue. In Nelson for Checkpoint, Tracy Neal. Gosh, we are hearing from a lot of workers about uh, time they worked and didn't get paid for. We will be back in touch with some of you. Thank you. Do keep, keep those texts coming in 2101. It's 17 minutes to six. DHB deficits growing, capital spending deferred and delayed, a mental health system under immense pressure, tension between the ministry and some district health boards, leaky buildings, and a question. If, as Labor claims, health has been massively underfunded, what will next week's budget do to address that? Tonight, as part of a special RNZ pre-budget series, political editor Jane Patterson looks at how the previous government funded the health sector and what we can expect from this government next Thursday. Here is Jane Patterson. Jacinda Ardern launched Labour's election campaign promising billions more for sectors she said had been neglected under National. 
So with the coalition government committed to spending an extra $8 billion over the next four years on health, is it true National underfunded the sector? Health Minister David Clark reckons more than $2 billion is needed just to get health funding to catch up to where it should be. If you put in all of that historic underfunding on top of what's needed for the current year, um, that, that would be an enormous sum of money um, and uh, we won't be doing that. But, uh, taxpayers expect us to be responsible uh, in terms of the way in which we uh, deliver services to make sure we get the most value out of every dollar that we spend and we're determined to do that. So we will meet cost pressures next year and there'll be a little bit of that historic underfunding returned as well. For capital spending alone, David Clark says Treasury has estimated it will cost $14 billion over 10 years to get health assets. That's things like hospital buildings up to the standard they should be. The prior government put a few hundred million aside um, and I think you know you don't have to be a mathematical whiz to realise that a few hundred million isn't going to address a $14 billion pipeline. So no, they didn't adequately fund for it. Before he left Parliament, I sat down with the former Minister Jonathan Coleman to talk about his stewardship of the health portfolio. He says money to keep DHBs operating was clearly a major demand. The fact is, though, that you have to make some savings, you have to reprioritise services, so that's always a big one. But there's also other initiatives. I mean, the $2 billion that went into the care and support workers settlement last year, you know, I mean, that was money really well spent, benefited 55,000 of the hardest working uh, people in New Zealand, of course, mainly women. In last year's budget, National allocated almost $4 billion in extra funding over four years, saying it was the biggest increase in 11 years. DHBs received an extra $439 million a year over the four years. However, just a few months ago, health officials warned DHB deficits could hit a combined $225 million if nurses accept the pay deal currently on the table. Even without that deal, the combined DHB deficits for this financial year were forecast to be $189 million. I asked Dr Coleman if the financial screws were too tight under national. The deficits as a proportion of the total budget were no higher under national than they were under the previous Labour government. So this huge focus on deficits is in some ways construing the debate. I mean, those deficits are a fraction of the total budget. Labour said they'll put $8 billion into health. Um, well, you know, if they've said they would do that and that's what they promised on the campaign trail, they've now got to stump up and do that and make good. The National Party leader Simon Bridges says there's nothing wrong with financial discipline. More money doesn't equal better always. I think it is important, uh, call me old fashioned, to have some tension in the system uh, where you are holding DHBs accountable, you know, you are pressing them to perform. The most recent Auditor-General report on DHBs notes one of the many costs contributing to financial pressure is what's called a capital charge, a 6% levy on the cost of any new buildings. And it says it's not clear what the charge is actually achieving and if anything appears to be giving DHBs an incentive to use debt funding. Peter Glensaw, a former DHB chair and former head of DHB NZ, says it's a major problem. And it begins to impact negatively on your operating income because you're having to pay interest for any money that you borrow plus this capital charge. So the minute you build something new, there's a whole series of new charges that, that uh, come in on your operating budget and add pressure on an already pressured situation. As an opposition MP, David Clark was critical of the capital charge. What's his view now as Minister? I think it needs a really good look. Yeah, I do. Um, it, you know, Treasury admit that it may have caused um, delays in investment that has led to infrastructure getting to its uh, being past its use-by date. It seems very sensible to me that we look at other ways of doing things. Agencies including Treasury and the Office of the Auditor General believe DHBs haven't been spending as much money as they should have on maintenance and upgrades due to their challenging financial circumstances. In the year to February, DHB capital spending was $225 million, $140 million below what was budgeted for them to spend. Last month, Treasury said that suggested some DHBs could be deferring repairs and maintenance to meet operational demands. It warned there was a risk of 
of an emerging health infrastructure deficit, which would need extra government funding. The most recent Auditor General report on DHB said financial sustainability was an ongoing concern and DHBs were under pressure to deliver more during a period of constrained funding increases. Dr Coleman said National spent $3 billion on new hospitals and buildings over its nine-year term and there was also capital funding for individual DHBs. To try and say that there's been a diversion of uh, capital funding into keeping operations going, so the running of the hospital, I mean that's actually quite incorrect. They're two separate uh, streams. Peter Glensaw says there's no question funding should be increased. At the moment it's pretty dire uh, that DHBs for many years have been working to uh, be as efficient as possible and to do the most with uh, the money that they have available. And I think that there is none or very little fat in the system. The government has already said it won't fully implement a $10 reduction for GP visits by July, as promised on the campaign trail, due to funding shortfalls inherited from National. Simon Bridges says National didn't leave any deficit surprises. I certainly don't take this, you know, whatever you want to call it, crisis, the sense of, you know, serious underfunding, seriously. I think it is politicking to lower the expectations uh, around the budget. And I think, actually, well, you've got to say a point that's perhaps been missed some, somewhat in the commentary. We've got fiscal responsibility legislation in New Zealand. They saw it all there. The Finance Minister, Grant Robertson, rejects any suggestion the government has overpromised. Having come into office, the extent of the issues that we're facing becomes clear. And it's all very well to have a pre-election fiscal update that gives you the numbers on a spreadsheet. But the reality of getting into government and seeing the conditions of our hospitals, the conditions of our schools, when you actually see the impact of that on the ground, that means that you have to look again at your priorities and your sequencing. But the plan that we've got stands. Whatever the politics, it's clear DHBs have struggled to operate under past funding levels. While nominal health funding has been increasing, Statistics New Zealand figures show the amount spent on health as a proportion of GDP has declined since 2009. The Auditor General concludes the rate of increased funding has levelled off since 2010. It says, for example, from 2010 to 2015 there was a 9.5% increase, compared to a 37.5% increase between between 2005 and 2010. The government's already committed to the extra $8 billion this term and will do more work before fully tackling the $14 billion capital bill. There are big expectations for next Thursday's budget, but ministers are already laying the groundwork for phased or delayed spending to be able to meet all of the demands and deliver on promises made. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. And Budget Day is next Thursday. Of course, we will be covering it in depth on Checkpoint. Scientists say Hawaii's Kilauea volcano may blow its top in the coming days or weeks, hurling ash and boulders the size of refrigerators kilometres into the air. Lava levels inside the volcano are dropping, and experts warn that if this continues, the lava will eventually reach the water table, triggering what could be a huge explosion. This report from CNN. Thick plumes of smoke fill the air. It was amazing and uneasy at the same time because you didn't know like what was going to happen. Seething from the mouth of Hawaii's Kilauea volcano, hazardous fumes. What it was was a big ash cloud. Um, as the lava lake has receded deep into the crater, the rocks in the steep crater walls are falling into that, and that's creating little gas ash, uh, gas explosions, and that's what created that real tall billowing cloud. At one crack inside Leilani Estates, the temperature reads 218 degrees. The U.S. Geological Survey warns of possible volcanic explosions, prompting national parks to close and airspace to be restricted. We could get into a situation where the water from, from the groundwater below the water table could mix in with the magma, and then we would have these steam-driven explosions. So larger fragments can be blown, blown out and, and greater distances. 
meaning higher ash clouds and rocks weighing up to several tons can be shot up into the air. It's just a really traumatic situation. A lot of uncertainty, you know, really unfolding minute by minute. We don't know what to expect. The volcano forced hundreds of people out of their homes as lava has swallowed streets, cars, and houses. It's an emotional roller coaster. It's up and down. Many left to wonder when the destruction and the legendary goddess of fire will subside. Because we don't know. It could be three weeks, three months, three days. We don't know. Pele is not done with us. That report from CNN. Uh, it's just weeks before the Prime Minister gives birth. Baby preparations are in full swing. The first couple settled into their new home in the Auckland suburb of Sandringham. Everything's going swimmingly. Jacinda Ardern plans to stay at home for the first six weeks before getting back to official duties with Clark Gayford taking on the job of full-time stay-at-home dad. Now, as part of an insight program uh, from Sunday morning, Hamish Cardwell has been speaking to fathers who are in a similar boat and to Mr Gayford about this role. In addition to all the usual pre-baby preparations, Clark Gayford says there are still boxes that need unpacking dotted about the house. He says he's been receiving tips from all over including quite a few pointers from members of the public. As you might imagine, people are, uh, are not um, shy about forthcoming with advice and it, and it appears that we have a book delivered at least once a week that has a note on it that says, this is the only book you'll need to read. And they're all completely different books. And I have a stack that must be about 10 high now. So yeah, it's a bit, bit daunting. <laughs> Which ones do you tackle? Since the announcement in January that he's going to be the primary caregiver, he's had lots of stay-at-home fathers offer their advice about what to expect. They all unanimously say it's the best thing that you're ever going to do. I haven't had anyone come up and whisper, run away, <laughs> just yet. Do they have more um, <clears throat> specific advice to you? The kind of things that are like, hey, look, these are the three things you need to do. Just, you know, well-meaning bits of advice around, um, what did someone, some wise sage come to me the other day and said, become friends with your child through each stage of your child's development. And I was like, okay. He was almost stroking his beard as he told me this. And I was like, right, okay, I'll remember that. Clark Gayford says he's reluctant to hog the limelight. By and large, I've been almost embarrassed about it in the sense that it's, it's just something that I, I, you know, it was pretty obvious that that was what I was going to have to do. And I don't feel particularly special about doing that because I do know that there's lots of dads out there that have been doing this for years and years and years. So to have attention around that being a, a something special that I was going to do doesn't, doesn't really sit that comfortably with me. But it's been nice when the dads have come up and they've been really excited to tell you about how it goes and, and what you have to look forward to. The first couple aren't attending antenatal classes, instead taking a condensed working professionals version with a midwife. But he's toying with the idea of starting a parents group at the official residence, Premier House in the capital. In the Wellington suburb of Wilton, Brendan Miller is hosting this week's Dad's Coffee Group for stay-at-home fathers. It's been going since about 2011, and he's been attending regularly since he took over as the primary caregiver for his two daughters about two and a half years ago, while his wife went back to work as a corporate lawyer. It's, it's pretty easy. We, just, um, we have a Facebook group that um, we use to communicate to the 50 or so members around Wellington. Um, every week we just chuck up an event, whether it's a coffee at someone's house or um, going to play, for, play at a park or go to a beach or just go and do something outside. Originally from Edinburgh, Derek Milne looks after his two daughters, age six and four. He stepped into the role when the oldest was three months old. It's certainly the hardest job I've ever had. You know, it's long hours, tough bosses, you know, always complaining, never happy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, these sort of children test you, don't they? they? They push buttons that you never knew you had, and so it's, I suppose it's that thing, you find out a lot about yourself. So with a bit of experience under their belts, what tips do the dads have for a soon-to-be stay-at-home father? Craig Smith's advice is to the point. Suck it up, yeah, uh, just do it, uh, get on with it. Um, it can be messy here and there, but at uh, the end of the day, your, your kids will be thankful that you were there with them in those first few years. But Derek Milne is a little more philosophical. Yeah, just, just do it. Enjoy it. I think it's sort of it's easy to get lost in the minutiae of 
tantrums and nappy changing and stuff, but you know, look at the big picture and you know, enjoy it. Remember to enjoy it because time moves fast and before you know it, they'll be up and gone. And so yeah, enjoy it. Now with just five weeks to go, Clark Gayford says the anticipation is building. Do you remember when you were young and you got the you, Christmas presents went under the tree too early and you just would stare at them and think, what's in that? What, what's in there? What's going on? It's like that now. So, you know, the, the reality's there. We know that we're, we're going to have a child and now I'm, I'm you know, pretty excited to, to meet it. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is due to give birth next month. For Checkpoint, Hamish Cardwell. And there will be more. That's from an insight. Actually, it's a chunk of an insight which will be going to air after the eight o'clock news on Sunday morning here on RNZ. That's Wallace's show, of course. Uh, it's about thirty seconds before the news at six. We're going back to Perth or just uh, south of Perth after the news this uh, shooting of seven people. Uh, we are getting so much feedback from people who work longer than they are paid for, often required by their bosses to start early but not paid for it. Keep those texts coming in 2101. We are going to get in contact with quite a few of you, some employers recurring, and we will talk to you in particular. Thank you. It's coming up to six o'clock. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. A building company has gone into receivership after being ordered to pay millions of dollars over a leaky Auckland high school. Hawkins built the Botany Down Secondary School in Auckland, which opened in 2004. With the sale of the company to Downer last year, responsibility passed to Orange H Group, which has now gone into receivership owing $30 million. Ruth Hill reports. A company director, David McConnell, says the firm had considered appealing the High Court judgment, ordering it to pay $13.4 million to the Ministry of Education. But given the state of its books, the board has decided this is unaffordable. He says it's now up to the receivers to deal with the Ministry of Education and other creditors. Mr McConnell says the decision to go into receivership was driven by a cash flow timing issue. The company is itself owed more than $20 million and has cash-backed bonds of $14 million. This is Ruth Hill. The chairman of the board of trustees at Botany Downs, Murray Goodman, says the school is disappointed but not entirely surprised to hear the news. Mr Goodman says the board will wait for more instructions from the Ministry of Education on the matter. Western Australian police are investigating the deaths of seven people at a property near Margaret River, 270 kilometres south of Perth. The bodies of four children and three adults were found at a rural property near the town early this morning. West Australian Police Commissioner Chris Dawson says the police are treating the case as a murder-suicide. Upon arrival, uh, police located seven persons deceased, uh, four children and three adults. The bodies of two adults were located outside. Five bodies were located inside a building on the rural property. Two firearms have been located at the scene. West Australian Police Chief Commissioner Chris Dawson. Nelson MP Nick Smith says having rat poison rubbed on him is the most serious abuse he's had in his 27 years as a politician. Mr Smith was giving evidence in the Nelson District Court today in a hearing against Rose Renton. He says protesters rubbed rat poison on him while he was at his National Party caravan at the weekly Nelson Market last September. Ms Renton denies she rubbed poison on Mr Smith and is defending a charge of offensive behaviour. Mr Smith says the incident was alarming for him and his volunteers. This would be the most serious incident in the, um, and it's the first time that I felt physically threatened to the point of, of calling the police and in my view it became offensive. Uh, when the poison was thrown and when the poison was rubbed on me. Nelson MP Nick Smith. Auckland police say a passerby saved the victim of a sexually motivated assault from a much more prolonged attack. They say the woman was running in St Mary's Bay about five o'clock this morning when a man grabbed her. He dragged her into bushes near St Mary's Road where he choked and indecently assaulted her. Detective Inspector Scott Beard says the attacker is about 180 centimetres tall of slim build with short black hair. It is terrifying and the woman was really lucky because there was a cyclist who was cycling past and heard some muffled type sounds and went back and saw the male on top of her and the male saw him, got up and ran off. 
Detective Inspector Scott Beard and the police have increased patrols in the area and are asking locals to check their CCTV for any sightings of the man. Christchurch retirement village residents have won a compromise from the Canterbury Regional Council in a battle over a bus route. In March, residents from the Diana Isaac Retirement Village in Mariho protested outside the council's office and handed over a 600 signature petition in a bid to stop the council relocating a bus route away from their home. The bus currently stops right next to the village driveway but was set to move a kilometre away. Today the council announced it would now detour a different bus route so that it stops 150 metres away from the retirement home. One of the protest organisers, Graham Tate, says that is a great victory. It's a huge difference. It's so important for old people to get out of this community of 600 people and see what's happening outside. It's good for their health, it's good for their self-being, and it's, it's good for the community too. Graham Tate from the Diana Isaac Retirement Village. The coroner has found an electric blanket which was more than 40 years old sparked the fire which killed a retired Thames man. 76-year-old Arthur Earl Plimley died of smoke inhalation last August after an electric blanket which he had modified to raise the voltage set his mattress alight. Mr Plimley, a radio enthusiast, was found dead in his home after a friend alerted police that he missed a broadcast, which was unusual. The coroner, Gordon Martinger, says as winter approaches, it's important for people to consider the age of their electric blankets. It's at five past six. Hurricanes coach Chris Boyd isn't too worried about Sonny Bill Williams' long-awaited return from injury for the Blues in tonight's Super Rugby clash at Eden Park. The All Blacks midfielder is back from a six-week break after fracturing his wrist and will start at second 5 eighths as the Blues chase back-to-back -back wins for the first time this season. Boyd is confident a Hurricanes side chasing their ninth consecutive win of the season will have few problems in readjusting. We had a bit of an inkling that Sonny was due to come back and offer, so you know the the team that we sort of prepared for is not far from from what they've rolled out. So well, we know it's a massive challenge. They'll be very keen to put on a good performance back at home, and and it'll be a good contest. Chris Boyd and tonight's game starts at 7:35. Meanwhile, Brumbies coach Dan McCallum says talk of Australian rugby's demise is greatly exaggerated. McCallum says he's sick of talking about New Zealand's dominance over Australian teams in the competition, with the Kiwi winning streak standing at 38 matches. The former Wallabies great Mark Aller has called for an open door policy, allowing players more freedom of movement between countries. And the New Zealand driver Brendan Hartley is aiming to back up his first point in Formula One with another good performance. When practice for the Spanish Grand Prix starts in Barcelona tonight, Hartley finished 10th at the most recent race in Azerbaijan. And that's the news. Tomorrow morning, Barbara Ehrenreich has had enough of what she calls our narcissistic obsession with health. Horvath Boostness tried to get behind the masks of the women of the far-right Golden Dawn Party in Greece. And Monique Fiso wants to make traditional Māori cooking a fine dining experience. Join me, Kim Hill, tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight. Tomorrow, Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Coromandel Bay of Plenty. Cloudy with showers turning to rain and some heavy falls tomorrow. Waitomo, Taranaki, Tomaranui, Taupo and Taihape. Periods of rain with some heavy falls from later today. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, Wairarapa. High cloud with isolated showers turning to scattered rain north of Wairarapa later tomorrow. Whanganui to Wellington, occasional showers clearing south of Whanganui tomorrow afternoon. Marlborough and Nelson, remaining rain clearing and then mainly fine. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, rain with some heavy falls in the south, clearing Fiordland tonight and elsewhere tomorrow morning. For Canterbury, mainly fine, however a few showers with southerlies tomorrow. For Otago and Southland, scattered rain spreading north, then clearing tomorrow morning. And for the Chatham Islands, mostly cloudy rain at times, clearing tomorrow afternoon. RNZ National, it's eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. I say go the...
the Blues. Yeah, that's going to be a crack of a game tonight. I'm a Canes fan, obviously, but I think the Blues are going to be tough. Uh, Anna Thomas, it's been so lovely having you with us for the past fortnight. Thank, thank you, it's you. been so, great. Yeah, we really appreciate See it. See you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Katrina back on Monday, but we've uh, loved your company. Thanks. Right, let's go to Western Australia. Seven people, including four children, have been found dead in a rural town in Western Australia. The bodies were found uh, at or near a property in Osmington in the Margaret River region and not far outside the town of Margaret River, just under 300 k south of Perth. The police say guns were involved in the killings, which could prove to be the single biggest incident of gun-related deaths since 1996, when a lone gunman killed 35 people in Tasmania, of course. Absolutely devastating news. We began with the uh, Western, the Australian Police Commissioner Chris Dawson holding a media conference. Uh, we had that at five o'clock and he sounded shattered. Let's go to Seven News reporter Jamie Freestone who joins us now live from Perth. Jamie, we are really uh, grateful that you're able to be with us. We can imagine you're very busy. What is the latest? John, yes, as you mentioned, we, we had a, a press conference with the Police Commissioner this morning who was holding this to talk about other matters and then it's become apparent about this tragedy in our southwest. It's in a place called Osmington, which is not far from Margaret River, the tourist, uh, popular tourist destination of Margaret River. And what is emerging is uh, absolutely horrific. Police took a call from a male at a rural property just after five o'clock this morning. And uh, they went to this property and they found seven people dead. Four of them are children. They were all inside this farmhouse there. Um, three adults also dead. Two were found outside surrounding this building. Police say they're, st they're trying to get in contact with the next of kin. They haven't detailed the ages of the children or the genders. They're still trying to get in contact with friends and family. Uh, but really, the police commissioner, as you mentioned uh, him, the way he was speaking, uh, yeah. said that this community will be reeling after this tragedy. Um, they've sent the police chaplain down there. Didn't go into specifics about what they believe has happened, but there were two firearms found on the property and he said that um, that there were gunshot wounds there. He didn't say whether they applied to all of the victims. Um, we are down there on the scene, a colleague of mine, 300, at least 300 metres away, the cordon that's been blocked off from getting near this property, but we have had our chopper up in the air and there are multiple forensic officers there on the ground. They are concentrating on the outside area of the home where um, some of these victims were found. And <clears throat> really is a tragic scene. Yeah, it, is. it sounds absolutely appalling. Uh, and I, I know it's very early days, Jamie, and uh, it's impossible to say definitively, of course, but the police are saying they're not looking for anyone else. And there is also a sense uh, that this phone call... Uh, the, the person who made that phone call um, to the police uh, talking about the shootings, that person hasn't been identified. So is there a sense early on that this is a murder-suicide? There is a sense of that, John, but uh, as you say, that they haven't revealed the identity of the person who, who made the call, um, but he was, the police commissioner did say he's connected to the right. property. Uh, so we and, we, and he also mentioned that the people who are, uh, no longer he, no longer with us uh, were residents at the property um, so there's still a lot to be revealed in this as to how this has all come about and, and who exactly is responsible for the deaths of very tragically four children and, and three adults. Jamie Freestone, who was with Seven News, joining us from Perth. Thank you, Jamie, so much for joining us. Uh, this is absolutely devastating. Very small community, Osmington. Margaret River is not a big town. Obviously a popular tourist area. Uh, lots of, of wine there and some pretty fantastic beaches not too far away. About 300k, or just less than that, south of Perth. A man is dead after crashing his car into a tree in an early morning police pursuit in Kawaro, the Bay of Plenty. It's the second death in a police chase this week after a man died in Taranaki on Monday. And another pursuit in Auckland this morning saw two schools forced into lockdown as armed police searched for three offenders, one of whom students say was wearing... A school blazer. Police arrived at Otahuhu College at around half past nine this morning after a car failed to stop four officers in Mangari. The three suspects had gone into the school, placing it and neighbouring King's College in lockdown. Sally Murphy went out there. I didn't know anything when we came to go to go shopping at Otahuhu. 
And then I saw the cars and all the police around here. Then I, when I asked one of the parents, and they said the son called um, someone is inside with guns. Kuliti Ma'alo was one of many concerned parents gathered outside Otahahu College today, waiting for news. Armed police lined the road as the Eagle helicopter circled above. Antonio was late for school this morning and arrived to find the commotion. We had to, uh, yo, we had to come wait outside here. But like the police signaled us to come wait on the other side. Yo. And then, uh, <clears throat> like, half an hour later, they caught a guy and they handcuffed him and took him to the police car. Armed police were called to the school at half past nine this morning after a car failed to stop for officers in Mangere. The three suspects had gone into the school. The police say two were quickly caught, but a third person was at large for some time before being found hiding in one of the college's hallways. Lonnie was in her technology class when the fleeing car pulled into the school. So we were just in class and then my friend came in and then that's when we saw people getting chased down and then um, our teacher told us to get underneath the desk so that they wouldn't shoot us. And then we had to go to the library and then hide and then that's when we saw the SWAT team. She says there was confusion because the offender was wearing a school jacket. The man was found in a school hallway and taken into custody. No weapons were found on him. Police left the scene and parents were taken into the school grounds for a briefing. Tamua Fita'alo, who has four children at Otahahu College, says he was relieved when it was all over. Any parents nightmare, I suppose. I only see it in overseas and the movies, but not here, really. School principal Neil Watson says the whole thing was handled extremely well by staff, the police and the school security. We'll have a debrief and we'll go through, but um, we've obviously kept the ministry informed as well, so we'll talk to them. But I think initial impressions are that it went reasonably well and we'll be looking at how we can improve things better because that's one thing we try and do. When students were released from the school, the mood in the year changed from anxiousness almost to happiness. Happy they have the afternoon off. Most said they were off home to watch Netflix. He, uh, after that he said that we can leave school, so everyone was happy. In Auckland for Checkpoint, Sally Murphy. It's coming up to 60 minutes past six on a Friday night. The union representing Qantas staff says workers are frustrated and fearful after a mystery leak inside this central Auckland building caused 15 people to be hospitalised. Workers in the 16-storey Augusta House building were evacuated in the morning after some began vomiting and getting headaches. They were allowed back in the afternoon before further staff members reported the smell and began feeling sick. The Auckland Regional Public Health Service says the leak was caused by an unknown chemical. Jesse Chang reports. People exposed to the mystery chemical, described as an organic sickly smell, experienced nausea, headaches and vomiting. Auckland City Hospital says it treated 15 patients with mild to moderate symptoms in its emergency department yesterday. It says they were observed for four to eight hours before being sent home. Qantas said yesterday that nine of the patients were their workers. John Crocker from Unite Union, which represents Qantas staff, says he was absolutely shocked when he heard what happened. We sent one of our field officers out there immediately um, to monitor the situation. You know, there was a lot of confusion. Um, we, you know, we're still not entirely sure what happened. And despite numerous tests, including one by the bomb disposable unit from fire and emergency, nothing was identified. Victor also ran comprehensive tests this morning, but didn't find any traces of natural gas. WorkSafe have launched an investigation into the building, but a spokesperson says that could take some time. Mr Crocker says there is increasing frustration among Qantas workers who aren't being allowed back inside. They're hanging around in the city, not really knowing what's going on, when they're going to get back to work or, you know, <laughs> when they should call it a day and head home. Um, obviously, they're, you know, they're a little bit afraid. They, you know, they, they don't want injury and they've seen their colleagues um, injured. But they're obviously frustrated by this, you know. While, while this investigation goes on, they're, they're as in the dark as anyone else. John Crocker says it's a serious situation. Well, the most important thing is the safety of our workers. We want to be completely satisfied that um, everything's uh, safe um, before, before they re-enter their workplace, um, to the best of our knowledge. You know, we, we've got to make sure that nothing like that happens again. So we need to you know, be completely thorough. The Auckland Regional Public Health Service says it is following up with people who have been unwell. 
In a statement, its Medical Officer of Health, Dr Denise Barnfather, says staff are interviewing those worst affected to get a clearer picture about where they were in the building when they were exposed to the chemical and what symptoms they experienced. She says no one should enter the restricted areas of the building until they're told it's safe. People who were exposed to the chemical and are experiencing symptoms such as burning in the eyes or back of the throat, shortness of breath or nausea and vomiting should seek medical attention immediately. RNZ spoke briefly to Bay Group, whose website says they own and manage the 32-year-old building, but the office manager declined to comment. The building houses a number of different businesses, including Qantas Airways. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi ahi ko Jesse Chang aho. It's coming up to 90 minutes past six. Auckland wants to attract wealthier visitors and make the city a more interesting place, especially at night and in the off-season. An overhaul of the city's tourism strategy moves away from attracting as many people as possible to offering visitors more cultural experience and more razzmatazz in the winter. As our Auckland correspondent Todd Nile reports, it could mean less focus on big summer events. Ah, Auckland. It's beautiful, isn't it? Over the years, the pitch has changed. Auckland. The show never stops. But now the game has changed, with those in Auckland's $8 billion a year visitor industry signalling a new direction. It's less focused on increasing visitor numbers and more about increasing their spending, with a target to rake in $14 billion in seven years' time. Steve Armitage from the Council's tourism agency, ATED, says it includes ideas such as more to do after hours. For most international visitors coming off a cruise ship or, and who are looking to stay uh, overnight, or people who are here for short breaks, something that we've actively promoted, the fact that um, the city's shopping offering closes quite early um, is a bit of a surprise. Viv Beck from the downtown promotion agency, Heart of the City, says in places like Sydney, Visitors spend more at night time than during the day. She says Auckland has already taken some good steps. We've already got events that are specifically around occasions, whether it's a late night at the art gallery or late night art. You know, at the end of the day, we have occasions that, that show that there is uh, opportunity at night, and it's about how do we bring all that together. Viv Beck says the big Commercial Bay retail centre near the waterfront in Auckland's CBD is expected to have later hours when it opens next year, which will be another improvement. The role of major ratepayer subsidised events, such as the now defunct Nines Rugby League Tournament, may become smaller. Steve Armitage says in the past there was co-funding from central government. There's a little bit of uncertainty about whether that's going to be something we can rely on ongoing. So we have to be a little bit more creative about our own funding, put more towards the business event space, start to develop more local content. Martin Sneddon headed the Industry Leaders Group, which helped develop the strategy, and for a while ran sporting events company Duco. He says major events aren't the be-all and end-all to attract visitors. They're useful adjuncts and, and contributors to the visitor economy in Auckland. Probably more valuable than those sorts of things are the regular activities that happen that bring visitors in consistently. Super Rugby has brought 21 members of the Porirua Club to Auckland to back the Hurricanes against the Blues at Eden Park tonight. They give the city the big tick, with exceptions. I went on the What's On in Auckland app and I, on, the, on the website and I, th- I think that needed to be a little bit broader than what it was. Transport last night was a nightmare to get to uh, where we were going and so on. In fact, it sort of put a bit of a damper on the night. The food choices are really good. I've, we've found the choices in places, the choices of places to eat are really good in Auckland. It's, in central Auckland it's been really good. The tourism strategy says more effort should be put into attracting visitors in the off-season, mirroring a nationwide push. Steve Armitage says more needs to be built around Auckland's cultural mix, especially Pacific and Maori culture. And I personally have a view that there is still a lot to be gained from um, you know, looking at Matariki as a property. It's not unique to Auckland, but we can put a a, a unique Auckland flavour to that and broaden that out to something that's potentially a month's worth of activity. One priority is to improve amenities that are also important to Aucklanders, walking, cycling and access to good public transport, especially to the airport and outer-lying communities. At the moment, it's just a strategy, but major players have an eye on the America's Cup and the APEC leaders' meeting in three years' time as a target to make changes. 
i tamaki makoro mo te hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Todd Nile tēnei. 23 minutes past six, a bill that would require employers to give a victim of domestic violence 10 days of leave from work in order to sort out their lives at home is suddenly on shaky ground. National has withdrawn its support and while the Greens have confidence New Zealand First is still on board, the party's indicated it will discuss that it at its next caucus. Our political reporter Gia Garrick has this story. Green MP Jan Logie's Members' Bill was introduced last year, born from stories and experiences she'd heard or seen unfold in her former role with Women's Refuge. I still have that memory of driving her right up to the door in the van and her basically kind of rolling out of the van into the workplace. Just all of us just quite terrified, to be honest, because he had people out hunting for her. And she went back the next day because at least at home she knew where he was. I don't, I don't want that to happen to women. The legislation would, in theory, make it easier for domestic violence victims to leave a bad situation by removing the stress of losing employment if they need to take time off work. The head of Women's Refuge, Ange Jury, says it's done exactly that for one employee at a business that already has domestic violence provisions in place, the warehouse. We had a woman who actually is one of the very, very few people who took all of the paid leave that was available to her, and that was to allow her to relocate, to move towns. Now, the warehouse kept her. She's a valuable member of their team. They haven't had to train anybody else. She's back being productive and fully engaged with her job. The win for her, win for the company. When the bill first came up at Parliament, it had strong National Party backing. I'm very pleased to be part of this movement right now that has unanimous support in the House. Can I just share in her joy when Parliament can recognise issues that are of importance to us all? I hope people will look back and say it was the 51st Parliament that put a marker in the sand and took serious action on family violence. But following a select committee process in which amendments were made to reduce an employer's say in the matter, the party got cold feet. Justice spokesperson Mark Mitchell says that's mostly because of the impact it could have on small to medium businesses. He says they could end up in arbitration or time or financially strained. There's often a second and third order effect and we have to be very careful that we understand what those effects may be and like I said, at the moment we feel that this bill could actually have a perverse outcome so we're being very cautious and very careful with it. But National says it is looking at introducing an amendment later in the piece that would ensure the party's support. That could be an exclusion of smaller businesses or having domestic violence as a classification under special leave rather than a standalone entitlement. The Employers and Manufacturers Chief Executive Kim Campbell says National's on the right track. Some form is needed. It's just that the, 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 the size of this and the detail, and I think National are quite right to try and modify this legislation so it can be more workable. Jan Logie would like the bill to pass with unanimous support, but she has her work cut out for her to get all parties on board. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Gia Garrick. 26 and a half past six, emotion and anger boiled over at a meeting in Roxburgh today. Staff of Roxburgh Children's Village and the town voiced their opposition to the closure of the facility. Dozens of people from the small central Otago community packed the local hall to have their say. Roxburgh Children's Village is a sanctuary for five to 12 year olds who've suffered trauma in their young lives. Along with another site in Ōtaki, it's on the chopping block as Stan Children's Services needs an additional $3 million to keep them open. Local mayors were told by the Prime Minister and the Minister for Children on Wednesday there was no additional funding available. Visibly emotional and angry, Central Otago Mayor Tim Cadogan told the Labour government he believed the promises they had campaigned on, but they were fast becoming the problem fast rather, rather than the solution. But the most emotional the moment came when a little girl who attended the village stood before the crowd and told them why it was too important to close. This is my second time at Stan Children's Services. It has changed my life because I've had a lot of hard times where I haven't been able to talk about stuff. Yeah talk about stuff and it's just changed how how I can actually tell how I'm how I how I'm feeling and it's just changed my life with it's helped my mum, my dad and my annoying little brother. <laughs> and I 
really wanted to stay because it's it's like the only thing that's helped. I'm so proud of you. Someone who seems to have loved her time at the Roxburgh Children's Village speaking to the crowd assembled. A final decision will be made on Tuesday. Just before we go tonight, uh, lots of feedback coming on following our story earlier in the programme about Smith City expecting staff on minimum wage to attend an unpaid daily morning meeting for 15 minutes. It seems Smith City aren't the only employers and we'll be following up on this next week. We've heard from so many of you, some employers recurring. Thank you. And this is bizarre. Hamish Cardwell's... Uh, Little teaser, really, from uh, Insight on Sunday morning. This is about Clark Gaffer being a stay-at-home dad. Now, lots of you have texted and said, did we just hear Jacinda's man saying he was looking forward to meeting her, referring to a new baby girl? Is it a girl? Did Clark Gaffer give away the gender of their first baby? People are asking, I can't wait to meet her, or did I miss the fact the cat is already out of the bag? Lots and lots of tweets. Hi, RNZ. Did Clark Gaffer say he was looking forward to meeting her at the end of your interview? Did he just reveal what the baby's gender is? Here's what Clark said. We're going to have a child, and now I'm, I'm you know, pretty excited to, to meet it. Let's listen to that again, Rangi. I'm, you know, pretty excited to, to meet it, to meet it, to meet it, yet, yet. Now, we can't say whether that was her or it. Her, I'm pretty excited to meet it or pretty excited to meet her, but by golly, uh, quite a few of you have texted in. You sound pretty excited to meet it too, or meet her too. We have no idea. Anyway, it's a nice night to end the week with, and whatever we, uh, whatever gender it is, we're sure it will be an absolutely wonderful little baby. That is Checkpoint for the week on behalf of our really fantastic team. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great weekend. We'll be back Monday at 5. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The firm behind Hawkins, which built the leaky Botany Down Secondary College in Auckland, has gone into receivership owing millions of dollars. West Australian police are calling a suspected murder-suicide in which seven people died, the worst mass shooting in Australia since the Port Arthur massacre in 1996. The coroner has found a 40-year-old modified electric blanket caught fire, killing an elderly Thames man, and residents in a Christchurch retirement village just celebrating the success of their petition to save their bus stop. Every week, these Murapara students welcome young overseas visitors to their school. And I've gone from being really shy and not being able to make eye contact or talk with anyone that they don't know to being really comfortable with people of all cultures. The stray uh, visitors really enjoy coming here and they really get a genuine